Hello watch lovers, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. My name is Dion and today we have a very nice little watch on the bench. It's a Patek Philippe, oh sorry, Patek Philippe from the late 1950s or early 60s, sometimes called the Gondolo, even though that was not the official name. It's a reference 3519. It's a fairly simple watch as we can see. It only has uh, two hands. But it does run and everything seems to work, which we would expect from a Patek Philippe. The case is in uh, nice shape. The owner doesn't want us to really do anything uh, with the case because it is in good shape and it's uh, probably not been uh, polished a lot. So uh, we're gonna just uh, make it a little bit uh, nicer. We see on the time grapher it's uh, running uh, pretty okay. Probably just needs uh, cleaning. Inside the watch we find uh, the very uh, well uh, regarded uh, 23300 movement. And as we'll uh, see in quite a lot of detail, it's a fantastically uh, finished movement. Somehow someone left a piece of Rodico inside the case. Not sure why, but uh, it's not there anymore. You might also have noticed uh, that the dial is a bit uh, dirty. There's also hair stuck in the hands, so that's uh, also not the best sign. But uh, as you might have seen, the case is very easy to open which means it's also easy for anyone to open it and uh, perhaps someone had a look and shouldn't have. So the movement is, uh, as I mentioned, the 23300. The 23 is uh, the millimeter uh, size of uh, the movement, so the diameter. Let's just have a quick look at uh, the dial before we continue. You can see it's very thin. And if you uh, guess why it's so thin, uh, let me know in the comments. The 23300 movement is uh, regarded as one of the very best uh, handwork movements uh, ever made. It's a uh, simple enough uh, architecture, but it's still got a few bells and whistles up its sleeve. And yes, I know I mixed uh, two idioms there. But it has got uh, things like uh, free sprung and gyromax balance a Breguet overcoil hairspring, shock settings for the escape wheel, and uh, so on. Now the first thing we want to do when we're going to service a watch like this is to let down the mainspring. The mainspring is what uh, gives power to the watch, uh, so uh, we want to remove that power when we take off the balance, and especially uh, the pallet fork and the pallet fork uh, bridge. Let's have a little look at the balance also. Do you see something that's uh, missing on this balance compared to, uh, let's say, regular watches? Yeah, that's right. There are no index pins. In a free-sprung balance, the hairspring oscillates freely without uh, the index pins. And to make such a balance accurate, you can see it's got a lot of small cutouts at the underside of uh, the balance. And this watch has, of course, been adjusted to five positions and hot and cold, so... Uh, that's part of what makes it expensive as well. Probably the first thing that strikes one as uh, one sees a um, modern Patek Philippe is uh, the extensive finishing and the really beautifully uh, made uh, parts. That wasn't actually always the case in the old days. Patek Philippe watches were always well made, but if you look at some older pocket watches, for instance, they were not specifically adorned. Whereas uh, newer Pateks, uh, let's say from the 1920s and uh, newer, are adorned in places only a watchmaker will uh, ever see. So while we're uh, gently and carefully dismantling uh, the movement. 
let's uh, have a little uh, talk about uh, Patek Philippe as a brand as well. And while I'm talking about this, let's also enjoy this fabulous finishing also on the underside of parts. And we'll of course uh, make an effort not to uh, make any uh, scratches as we go along. Oh darn it! Yeah, I'm an idiot. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, Patek Philippe uh, of course has a uh, fantastic uh, brand image. Eight of the last ten uh, most expensive watches sold are Pateks. They have uh, probably the best slogan in uh, the watch industry, or maybe in a lot of industry uh, overall, where uh, you never really own a Patek Philippe. You just take care of it for the next generation. It's a fantastic slogan. And that uh, marketing savvy is really part of what has made uh, Patek Philippe uh, probably the most uh, coveted brand. They started out uh, relatively meekly back in uh, the mid-19th century. It was actually started by uh, two Polish uh, guys, one uh, businessman and one uh, watchmaker. And that uh, watchmaker's name was Czapek. And uh, you will find early Pateks uh, with uh, Patek, Czapek and C on the dial. That partnership uh, expired after just a few years. And that's when uh, Patek joined up uh, with uh, Philippe, jean andré Philippe, who had already made a name for himself uh, by inventing a keyless works for pocket watches. And just a few years after they joined up, uh, the name was also then changed to Patek Philippe and C or Co. And that very same year as they changed the name, they uh, also exhibited uh, watches at the London Fair in uh, 1851, where one of their watches caught the attention of Queen Victoria herself. And looking at that watch, it's a beautiful watch by all means, and of course very well made. But seeing the movement, we can see it's a high quality movement, but not at all adorned to the standards we're uh, kind of used to associating with uh, Patek Philippe of today. And it's worth noting that uh, the standard wasn't uh, higher than other watch manufacturers at the same time either. But in sales, you often talk about uh, unique selling points. And keep in mind that uh, the Keyless Works was invented by Philippe. So basically, they were the only watches with a Keyless Works. So all other watches available would require you to uh, keep a key with the watch, as you see in the photo here. So going from always being required to have the key with you, with the watch, having to open the watch, to wind it, to set the time and so forth, to using keyless works was a pretty major thing. So at least my theory would be that uh, the key reason that Queen Victoria wanted this watch was exactly because of that invention. Because the quality of uh, the Patek Philippe watches uh, was very good, but uh, not uh, anything uh, much better than other manufacturers at that time. But they had the keyless works. But what really uh, distinguished Patek Philippe in this period was Philippe himself. He was a fantastic watchmaker. He uh, made a lot of complications that are still extremely difficult to do today. Like a perpetual calendar, a split seconds chronograph and so forth. First in pocket watches and then later also in wrist watches. So they really gained fame uh, with the complications, and that's of course a mainstay with the brand also today. An important point in that history is when they were commissioned to make the world's most complicated watch at the time for uh, a New York banker called Henry Graves. Now hold that thought, I'll get back to it, because we're just going to have a look at the beautiful finishing of uh, some parts in this movement. All the parts are hand finished by people who do only that. This has got a beautiful uh, anglage, that is to take away the sharp edges of metal. We see it's also finished on the underside with a simple brushing. But this is what makes uh, Patek watches expensive. It takes a long time to do this for every individual part. Alright, 
with uh, all the parts laid out. We can then start putting them in uh, the cleaning basket. Worth noting that uh, modern cleaning machines are uh, very gentle with the parts, but we're still going to space them out a little bit extra, given that it's a Patek. And while that simmers on slow boil for uh, 30 minutes, let's turn our attention to the case. We're going to use a gold cleaning liquid on it. Man, even those sounds uh, sound like a symphony, you know? But the ultrasonic doesn't. So brace yourselves. So we've got the movement back from the cleaning machine. We can start by oiling the barrel and putting in the mainspring. I'm going to use a mainspring winder for this. And while I do that on uh, the video, I'm going to finish the history of uh, Patek Philippe. So in 1933, they finished uh, Graves' watch with 24 complications, almost a thousand different parts. And pretty much at the same time as this watch was delivered, uh, the company was bought by a very rich uh, Swiss family called the Stern. And that family still owns Patek Philippe. And one of the first things they did was to open up the US market. Because until then the US didn't have a distributor or an official sales chain for Patek Philippe. But the Stearns already had an agency selling watches in the US. And Patek Philippe kind of became the sister brand of Universal Genève. And it's really in this period that you see uh, Patek Philippe's focus on complications being combined with a focus on extreme high level of finishing. So that was kind of the birth of uh, Patek Philippe as we know today. Anyway, let's put the main spring back into the barrel. The barrel arbor can be a little bit tricky with these watches where you have uh, the barrel under the barrel bridge. And as always, we're going to lubricate where there are friction points. And there are friction points uh, on the barrel arbor where it uh, meets the lid. And then the barrel is ready. We're going to treat a few parts with this uh, liquid called the Fixo Drop. We put the parts into this little uh, plastic basket. And then we have this special uh, glass. You can see it's like hourglass shaped. Extremely expensive glass. It's like a hundred uh, whatever your currency is. Except if it's yen, then it's hundred million probably. And to make sure there's no residue, we're going to also then uh, tap the pivots into a little bit of pithwood. And then we can proceed to uh, oil the uh, capstones. Put a little drop in the middle of the capstones. Also to reduce friction, of course. And with the chatons on top, we can uh, lock uh, the shock settings over and uh, place them back in the, the balance.
And that is a beauty to behold. All right, with the balance in good order, let's start assembling the watch. We're also going to put a little bit of oil on the other side of the barrel arbor. We're using quite thick oil here, so D5 or HP1300. And we remember that uh, the winding works, the motive works, are underneath the barrel bridge, so we're going to have to put that in first. And just look at uh, the finishing on the underside of that bridge. Beautiful uh, perlage finish. And of course the tips of the screws are also highly polished. And then we have uh, the click spring. And that's not your grandpa's click spring, folks. Look at this. And it's held in with two screws. I'll show you one of those screws here. It's not under that massive piece of uh, plank. Sorry, toothpick. That is the screw. So yeah, it's not uh, exactly uh, big. And there are two of them. Of course, again, both uh, polished. So just the level of uh, craftsmanship is quite ridiculous uh, in a lot of ways. It's just fantastic. And by the way, for watches to uh, get the Geneva seal, one of the criteria is that they do not have uh, wire springs. So that's why you see these uh, delicately made uh, springs on uh, watches with a Geneva seal. And Patek Philippe watches are, I think, about 95% of all Geneva seal watches. Or were, rather, until I decided the Geneva seal was not... Uh, Let's say refined enough so they created their own PP seal. All right, I've been doing a lot of talking so far, so uh, let's just enjoy this beautiful movement uh, in silence for a little while. Now the crown is full of some sort of organic material. And I'm not sure I want to know what it is, but uh, there is a lot of it. So we're gonna take all that out 
and then we're also going to take off the gasket and uh, put in a new one. After doing that, we can then uh, put uh, the crown and stem back in uh, the movement. There's quite a lot of friction points in uh, the keyless works, so we're going to make sure we lubricate all of those. And we also see that there's one oil sink that will be hidden underneath uh, the minute wheel. So we're also going to have to remember to uh, lubricate that before we put the minute wheel on. Now, I also mentioned in the post about uh, this video coming up and being back from vacation that I've uh, made a radical uh, lifestyle change. And no, I'm not uh, quitting uh, wrestling uh, polar bears or uh, juggling uh, running burning chainsaws. I mean, those habits are a little bit too hard to break, to be honest. But as uh, most watchmakers, I'm uh, middle-aged. And unfortunately, it's quite easy for men to uh, let go a little bit when they reach middle age. I'm uh, a bit more than 50 years old and uh, I was in really good shape for about 35 years of my life. And in the last uh, few years, uh, I wasn't. And this last few years uh, is perhaps best illustrated by my six-year-old daughter's drawings. She's a real daddy's girl, so she likes to uh, make drawings of uh, daddy and uh, herself. But she draws me as a circle. A circle. I mean, what's up with that, right? Anyway, we all know that uh, drunk people and kids tell the truth. So um, I decided to actually do something about it, and that's the radical uh, lifestyle change. I decided that I want to be there when my kids turn 50 years old. And it sort of uh, struck me that uh, you never saw any old people drawn as circles, i.e. being fat. I mean, Daddy Pig comes to mind for uh, the Peppa Pig lovers out there. So to really have a long life, it is pretty important not to be really overweight. Because that fat will kill you. You don't see fat old people, right? For a reason. Anyway, let's uh, also oil the escapement now that we uh, got it in place. And again, we can just admire this beautifully finished uh, pallet fork. Really something else. So to uh, come back to the radical uh, lifestyle change, my favorite food is and probably always will be pizza. And pizza is not good for you. And I've been drinking probably a liter, liter and a half of uh, Diet Coke every day. That's not good for you. Been eating a lot of sweets, processed foods. That's not good for you. So I made a big change. I stopped drinking uh, Coke. I replaced it with uh, H2O. I stopped eating a lot of processed foods. Started uh, eating uh, basically food from uh, the farmer. And I already lost like 12, 13 kilos. Just came off uh, three day fasting, which is good for your body. So yeah, 
happy with that. Speaking of happy, also happy with how the watch runs after simply cleaning it. No adjustment needed. So that's uh, nice to see. Anyway, let me know in the comment field if you get a little inspiration from uh, my story as we uh, turn our attention to the case again. These uh, square or rectangular cases basically always have glue holding uh, the crystal to the case. The crystal is uh, quite thin, so I decided to just put it in uh, the ultrasonic and then it's going to come off pretty easily afterwards. The uh, owner didn't want me to uh, refinish the case in any way, but uh, we can at least take out uh, some of the oxidation, some of the marks from that. So let's go ahead. And with the case uh, nice and shiny, let's then uh, look at how we glue that uh, crystal back into the case. We're going to use this uh, special product called uh, Minicol. It is a special kind of glue that uh, stays liquid until it's exposed to ultraviolet uh, rays. At that point it solidifies and it's uh, completely transparent so you, you're not going to see anything. So it's a great product. Very important to keep this uh, syringe in that black uh, bottle or a tube it came in, so it's not exposed to uh, sunlight and uh, thereby coagulates by itself. And then we can put uh, the crystal back. We also clean the crystal. It was uh, dirty, but it's not uh, scratched or broken, so that's uh, very good news. And then we can put it in an ultraviolet machine. That flickering is just because of the frame rate of uh, the camera doesn't flicker to the naked eye, but it will solidify after a few minutes, or rather start the process after a few minutes and then uh, let it uh, sit for a few hours and then it's going to be uh, completely uh, fit. Now looking at the dial. The first thing that struck me when I saw this watch was that uh, the dial didn't really look uh, correct. Especially I thought that uh, the lettering looked a little bit funky. There's also no accent over the second E in the Geneve or Geneve. But I do actually believe that it is uh, correct, that it is uh, not repainted. Because looking at other old uh, Patex, there is quite a lot of funky uh, lettering actually. This is an example from the Patek Philippe Museum, which I really doubt is uh, repainted. And looking at some other uh, certified genuine watches as well, we see there's a little bit uh, awkward spacing between some of the letters. And all in all, this could be a redial, but it might actually very well uh, be the original. The owner has requested uh, an extract from the Patek Philippe archives. The extract itself will not say whether uh, the dial was refinished, but uh, there might very well be a comment on it in the accompanying uh, letter or mail. So that will be interesting to see.
What we also see on the dial is that uh, the hour markers are pretty oxidized, quite a few of them. So we're going to remove that oxidation very gently. And we can see that gets the shine back, and that's uh, nice to see. And after a little bit of work, the dial looks quite good. We need to clean up that little residue and a couple of uh, strands of uh, fiber from uh, the Q-tip. The what? Yeah, the Q-tip. And with that, we're pretty much ready to put uh, the dial back on. We need to remember the hour wheel, otherwise we wouldn't be able to show the hours. Of course, this watch does not have a second sand. We can then place the hour hand. I believe all these uh, elements are made of gold, but I could be wrong. We always want to make sure that uh, the hands are parallel to the dial. One of the worst things uh, you see is uh, when a hand actually touches the dial and after a while it will, of course, inscribe a circle. That's not nice. All right, with our hand nicely lined up to 12, we can then put uh, the minute hand on as well. And look at that. Spot on at the first try. Luck is my shepherd. All right, then we can uh, case the movement. You might have seen that the case has uh, quite a few hole marks. The case uh, was made in uh, Geneva. It is of 18 karat gold. And the last thing to do is put on uh, the crystal and the bezel. And with that satisfying snap, we just need to put a strap on. And then we can see the watch on the wrist. That is a very stylish vintage watch. We didn't do much about the case. It looks really good. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then click and like and subscribe will certainly help the channel. We'll be back shortly with another video. Until then, ta-ta.